Hello and welcome to this Revision Monkey video on the required practicals that are going to be in Biology Paper 2. This video is for the AQA specification and it is for separate scientists only. Those are students that do six one hour and 45 minute exams at the end of their course, sometimes called triple scientists in some schools. And this is for the higher tier. So for the 2022 exam, the examiners have told you to focus on plant growth and organism distribution required practicals. So that's what the rest of this video will be on. And have a look at in the description because I'll put a link in there for the content for this biology paper too that they've asked you to focus on. And I'll also put a link to some questions to practice on these required practicals. Organism distribution required practical. There are two different ways that we are going to look at to sample organisms. The first one is random sampling and the second one is transex. So random sampling might be used to estimate a particular population size. So for example, you might get a question a little bit like this that says describe a method to estimate the population size of daisies growing in a 200 metre by 100 metre school field. These numbers here will come up a little bit later on in our calculation. So we can't count every single daisy growing in the school field. It would just take too long. So we need to have a method of sampling that is completely random. And if they talk about why in the exam, it is to avoid bias. So as we said, we can't count the number of daisies in the whole 200 meter by 100 meter field. So instead, we measure out an area of the field using a tape measure. So here I've got a 5 metre by 5 metre area, for example. We then divide this grid up into squares using string and number those squares 1 to 100. So our grid might look something like this. Then the most important thing with random sampling is we use a grid called a quadrat. Now the one I'm going to use in this example is a 0.5 meter by 0.5 meter quadrat. In the exam it may well be a, a different size but that's absolutely fine. And we need to choose where to place our quadrat within this grid. So again it would take too long to do all 100 squares and count the number of daisies in each square. So what we use is a random number generator to select a square and you can get those on calculators or phones and it will pick a number at random for you. So we place a quadrat on that selected square and count the number of daisies present and then we repeat the steps for perhaps nine more random squares. So we might do ten in total. So let's say our random number generator picked us out the number nine. What we do is we take our quadrat and we place that on square 9 and we count the number of daisies present. We would then repeat that for another square. For example, if our random number generator there picked up us up 47, we'd place our quadrat on 47, count the number of daisies present. And again, for example, 72, again counting the number of daisies present. Now we'd repeat that for around 10 squares. So we've got different quadrats here and we've counted the number of daisies present in the squares. And we're going to then calculate a mean number of daisies per quadrat. And because we're going to use this number again in a minute in a calculation, I'm just going to leave it as a decimal rather than rounding it as I would do normally with a mean. So we've got a mean number of daisies per quadrat. And now we need to use this to estimate the number of daisies in the whole school field. So we need to know our area of our quadrat. So we do 0.5 times 0.5, and that's 0.25 meters squared. We need to know the area of the school field. So from, given in the question, it was 200 meters by 100 meters, so 20,000 meters squared. The next thing that you need to work out is the number of quadrats that would fit in the field. So we've got the area of our field divided by the area of one quad quadrat, and that gives us 80,000 quadrats. So if 80,000 quadrats fitted in our field and the number of daisies in each quadrat was 0.8 as an average, 
then the estimated number of daisies in the whole field would be our number per quadrat multiplied by the number of quadrats that would fit in the field. So 0 0.8 times by 80,000 would give us a total estimate of 64,000 daisies. A couple of key points then. Increasing the number of squares sampled will increase the reliability of the population size estimate. They may use the word reliability or they may use the word accuracy, but the more quadrats that you put down on that field, the more reliable your estimate is going to be. Now, for some organisms, calculating percentage cover might be more appropriate than counting the number of organisms. For example, you may well have seen um, something like lichen growing on trees or walls. If you wanted to sample lichen, you might use a really small quadrat, so just perhaps a 10 by 10 centimetre grid. In the previous example with daisies, we would look at one random square which we'd selected by our random number generator, and we calculate the number of organisms inside. However, with lichen, we can't do this because you can't see individual organisms. So instead, you might need to count the number of squares covered by the lichen. Now, all of the whole squares you can just count up like so, and then we will look at any partial squares that we've got, like perhaps this one and this one, where they could fit together roughly to make a complete square. And we will continue to do this, estimating the total number of squares that are covered by the lichen. So when we've got this, we use the equation, the number of squares covered divided by the total number of squares times 100, and this will give us our percentage cover. So if I've estimated that 30 squares in total are covered by the lichen, there are 100 squares on the grid, so 30 divided by 100 times 100 will give us an answer of 30% coverage. Another way we could sample the distribution of organisms is using a transect. So for this we might be asked questions such as how does light intensity affect organism distribution? Or how does the distribution of organisms change as you get further from the shore? So let's take this example in terms of seeing how light intensity affects organism distribution. So under the tree, the organisms will be subject to more shade than further away from the tree. So we can sample the organisms at regular intervals and see how the light intensity affects their distribution. So what we do is we would lay a transect line. This could be a tape measure or some string along the ground starting at the base of the tree. We would place a quadrat at the zero meters mark and count the number of organisms, so for example daisies or it could be something else that you're looking at, present in the quadrat. We would use a light meter to take a recording of the light intensity and record this in a table. We then repeat steps two and three at regular intervals along the transect line, for example, every two meters. So we place our quadrat and our light meter here, 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 each time counting the number of organisms, for example, daisies or whatever we were looking at, and calculating the light intensity. Now, I want you to imagine that we're sampling in a woodland and along the transect, away from the tree, there's lots of long plants and long grasses. Now in this case we simply can't place a quadrat on top of the long grass okay? because the grass is just far too long. So you might see an exam them talking about counting the plants that are just touching the transect line. So if you've used string and pulled that along the long grasses you might be simply counting the different species that are touching the transect line. Another thing to look out for, don't be put off if they talk about wanting to measure something vertically. So for example, they could look at how height affects leaf size or how height affects lichen coverage. In this case, think about doing the practical in exactly the same way. So you may use a, squirt, a very small quadrat and measure percentage cover of something as you go up. Or you might simply, if you're measuring leaf size, for example, see any leaves that were touching 
the line and measure their size as you go up and see how that changes as you go up the transect. So don't be put off if they're talking about one vertically going up a tree or up a wall or something like that. It's exactly the same process as the horizontal transect that we looked at before. Plant growth require practical and this is for separate scientists only. When you're looking at plant growth in a lab you're going to want to use a seed such as mustard seeds or cress seeds that are going to grow very quickly. There are a number of different factors that you could investigate to see the effect that they have on plant growth. I'm going to go through a few of those but you have to be resilient in the exam because they could talk about a number of different factors. The first one we'll look at is this question which says how does light intensity affect plant growth? So for this practical we would set up a petri dish and inside that petri dish you, might, you could have a small um, layer of soil or you could simply just have some, some damp cotton wool. Seeds will grow very easily so cotton wool would be absolutely fine. And you would put a certain number of seeds on there making sure you keep that constant. So I've put five seeds on the dish and if we're looking at light intensity we could change the distance between the lamp and the petri dish for example. So our independent variable would be the distance between the light and the petri dish and this would therefore change the light intensity reaching the plant. Our dependent variable would be the height of the plant and control variables would include the same number of seeds per petri dish, the power of the lamp, the type of seed that we're using, the volume of water that we add daily and the temperature. And depending on the practical we might want to measure the rate of growth and we may want to measure the height of the plant every day or we may just want to leave it for a set number of days and measure the height of the plants afterwards. So to measure the height of the plant you would put your ruler um, so it's touching the cotton wool or the soil or whatever you're using and hold the plant gently so you can see at the moment the one that the ruler is next to is slightly bent so you'd hold it gently up against the rulers to get an accurate height. So you'd measure the height of each of the seedlings in each of the discs and you'd have an average height that the plants have grown under each light intensity which you would then record in a table. A different question that you might want to ask might be how does the direction of light affect plant growth? So this time keeping the distance between the lamp and the petri dish the same but changing the direction so perhaps having the light coming in from the left or the right or from directly above for example. So in this case our independent variable would be our direction of the light source. Our dependent variable might be recording the direction of the plant growth. Our control variables important things as before like the same number of seeds per petri dish the power of the lamp, the type of seed, the volume of water added, temperature and in this case the addition of an extra one which is the distance between the lamp and the seeds. And then because of phototropism and the response to light we would have the plant growing and changing direction towards the light source. And in the exam you may well be asked to draw drawings of the seeds to show how you might predict them to grow or as a result of a particular experiment and in which case you would use clear pencil drawings. Again linking into tropisms, this case geotropism, we might want to look at how the angle of the petri dish affects plant growth and in this case we might want to set up the petri dishes at different angles and then record plant growth. In this case our independent variable would be our angle of our petri dish so we might want to do 180 degrees, 90 degrees, 270 degrees etc. Our direction of our plant growth would be what we are going to record down after our experiment and our control variables would be again similar things to before and make sure we're keeping the direction of the light source the same and also light intensity or background lighting we'd want to keep the same in this one as well. As a result of this experiment then we may expect results a little bit like this um, whereby the shoots are responding to gravity and growing upwards in all cases. Now you may well in the exam also see experiments where you can observe the direction of root growth as well so look out for those ones too. 